Good afternoon, good, afternoon uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, evening or morning from everywhere around the world. Welcome to the webinar Israel, Palestine and the question of apartheid. This webinar is organized by DOCP, Palestine Link and the Rights Forum. This webinar series aims to address questions of apartheid in uh, Israel, Palestine, South Africa and beyond. In this series of webinars, we discuss the relevance of the concept of apartheid for analyzing the human rights situation in Palestine, for analyzing the struggle against institutionalized oppression, discrimination and colonization. Um, apartheid is a crime against humanity, uh, as is uh, constituted in the Convention of 1973 and 1998 Rome Statue of International Criminal Court. It is also a very controversial concept and a lived reality, both in the past, in South Africa, and in current situations. In three webinars, we will discuss this concept, but also very much so, the lived reality of apartheid. The first webinar took place on the 28th of May. Uh, it was about the crime of apartheid in Israel and South Africa. The two main speakers were John Dugard and Virginia Tilly, and I invite you all to listen to the podcast, which is now placed on uh, the web links of DOCP, Palestine Link, and the Rights Forum. The second section, second session, the second webinar, um, had Diana Butu and Kulut Al Aljarma speak about the law and legal consequences of apartheid, which was also uh, one can listen to uh, on the mentioned uh, website, um, which will also be linked. Uh, later today. Today, in the third and last session of this webinar, we will discuss the lived experience mobilization um, of apartheid. And we have two esteemed speakers and a discussant. Um, first, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Anna de Jong. I'm an associate professor in anthropology of conflict at the University of Amsterdam, and I will be your co moderator for today. The setup today will be we have the speaker Ilan Pape first for 20 minutes, second Ronnie Castillo, and a discussant uh, Alice Samsung Estape from the uh, European BDS uh, will start off the questions. Your questions can be sent uh, in the uh, chat and will be uh, collected by my fellow co, -mo co uh, moderator uh, Sonia Zimmerman, who is also the director of Doc P. So, without further ado, let me introduce the three speakers to you today. The first one is historian Ilan Pape. Ilan Pape is a well-known name and should not need any introduction, but just in case, he's an Israeli historian who is also known as a new historian. Basically, this is a, um, either an insult or a badge of honor, meaning that he critically examined the modern history of both Israel uh, and Palestine. He used to be a lecturer at the University of Haifa and was the academic director of the Gifat Hafifa Jewish Arab Center for Peace. Political pressure, um, continued exclusion um, in Israel, however, made um, uh, Ilan Pape move to the, uh, to the Great Britain to become a full professor of history at the University of Exeter. Um, it's, he wrote too many articles, videos, and gave too many interviews to name them all, but at least um, uh, the privilege of being the moderator. My two favorites are A History of Modern Palestine in 2004 and the book The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine in uh, 2006. Um, after we have Ilan Pape speak, we uh, then give the floor to Ronnie Kasdil. Ronnie, very much welcome. Um, Ronnie, is well, Ronnie is a well known inspirational anti-apartheid activist and uh, very much a former politician of the good kind in South Africa. <laughs> he was um, mobilized, I should say, or can we honestly in this setting say radicalized uh, by the Sharpeville massacre to become an active part of the anti-apartheid uh, struggle. Um, he did not just join in protest, but was very active in the underground activities and had a leading role in the unfortunate Bishop massacre in 1992, where 80,000 protesters marched and the Cisco um, Defense Force opened fire on 
uh, innocent anti-apartheid uh, protesters. This left him, however, undeterred and later became uh, part of the MK High Command. Um, he is also a fervent and outspoken critic of Israel and has many experiences on the ground in Palestine listening to Palestinian comrades. Um, that despite multiple attacks and smear campaigns uh, to his personal uh, being. Last but not least, I will, after these two prominent speakers, give the floor to Alice Samson uh, Estape, which is the head of the BDS uh, Europe. She will surely enlighten us uh, with the questions she has for these two speakers. So in, uh, in brief, let me open, uh, hereby open the floor uh, to Ilan Pape for the third session of the webinar series Israel, Palestine, and the question of apartheid. Ilan, can you please join us by camera and take the floor? You've got a camera. I can't. I'm not on camera. No, I do hear you, but I do not see you. Oh, I see. Wait a minute. I'll see where the camera is. And uh, you. Don't know where the camera is. It should be on the right top floor. Uh, of the options. Why doesn't it show me? <laughs> uh, okay. What do I have to do on the right one? The, on the right one, I don't have many options. I just have the mic and the three uh, and a little figure of a man maybe it's a different one do you want to leave the web line no i don't let's um, see you can um, on the right side you see a little uh, guidance panel and you can click on the top one view and there should be a webcam no, I, I, i'm oh, getting my... from the audience that the audience can see elon no they can see you they can see yeah, Elon. I... okay that's oh, great then we go the organizers cannot, but that's fine. Um, I yeah, think your your voice is the most important anyway. Thing. Okay, if the audience can see me, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Uh, okay. Ilan, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. The floor is all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's very strange. I cannot see myself. And I cannot see anyone, but as long as everybody can see me that's great it's a great pleasure and honor to be with ronnie a very very good and old friend of mine and uh an, an idol of mine and uh it's a great honor to share uh, the podium uh, with him we did it before hopefully we will do it again very soon in person and thank you very much for inviting me uh, i would like to uh, because i have a very short time uh, uh, to start by stating uh, three facts which I think are relevant for discussion of apartheid uh, uh, in Israel and Palestine. In particular, I was guided to talk about the experience of an activism, uh, a Jewish activism in Israel in, from this, in this context of uh, 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 the apartheid uh, paradigm or the apartheid comparison. So I want to start with three facts and then relate to them because I think they're very important for any fruitful discussion on the relevance of the apartheid paradigm or a case study to uh, Israel and Palestine today. The first fact is that in 1987, uh, I think the first time that any academic properly kind of uh, called Israel an apartheid state uh, uh, was Uri Davis in a book called Israel and Apartheid State. Uh, it's not that people did not use the uh, the comparison before 1987, but I think it was the first time that it appeared in kind of a, a coherent uh, way in a published book. And uh, his own position is very interesting uh, for explaining how much work there's still to be done uh, on the question of apartheid and its application to the case of Israel and Palestine. He himself was, as you know, one of the few, I think one of the two members, Jewish members of the Fatah, uh, uh, at the, and he wrote the book at the time when the Fatah movement and the PLO had already uh, uh, sponsored uh, or adopted the two-state solution, solution uh, uh, which on the face of it allows for a Jewish nation state um, next to a Palestinian nation state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. 
So on 78% of Palestine, according to this paradigm, 78% uh, of Palestine, which is Israel without the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, uh, this kind of discourse or this kind of uh, a solution allowed for a Jewish nation state that given the history, its history, its ideology, its demographic could only have been an apartheid state. So in many ways, when people talked about the two state solution, sometimes without, without even paying attention to it, they were talking about a Palestinian nation state, an independent state next to an Israel that if it remains a Jewish state could only have been an apartheid state. Uh, that is even uh, if uh, uh, we're talking about the best two-state solution we can we can think of, namely a fully independent sovereign Palestinian state without one Jewish settlers in it, without one Israeli soldiers on its on its uh, territory, it still does not uh, uh, guarantee that Israel, uh, even this smaller Israel, will not be an apartheid state. That's the first fact we have to take into account. And I think a lot of the people who are genuinely believing in peace and uh, uh, are still basing their hopes on a two-state solution tend to forget it. And I think some of it uh, came out in the first webinar of this uh, series uh, with John Dugard's position on this question. The second point, which is very important, is that the PLO had only uh, two Jews in it. Uri Davis, whom I mentioned, may he lo live long, and the late and wonderful Ilan Halevi. Uh, but the PLO's peace policy, after adopting the two-state solution, uh, and this is also today the Palestinian Authority's position, was based on this uh, model that said that there are two peace camps on both sides. And these two peace camps would push for a reconciliation eventually. Um, and. Uh, uh, this was the, this is still the position today of whoever represents the Palestinians officially, be it Palestinian members in the Israeli Knesset or the Palestinian Authority. Now, it is true that when you uh, speak privately or if you read between the lines, the positions of even prominent members of the Palestinian leadership today, you can still hear that some of them are still loyal to the older liberation struggle instincts that uh, does not believe in the existence of a Zionist peace camp and does not rely, does not pin its hopes for a future solution on such a camp, but rather understands that if anything can happen from within the Jewish society in Israel, it is the increase in the number of anti-Zionist Jews who believe like the Palestinians uh, officially did until the 1980s, that the whole of historical Palestine should be decolonized, de-Zionized, and liberated. So I think that, that's the, um, the, the, the second fact that we should take into account, that uh, any, any discussion uh, on apartheid that somehow is still connected to the idea of a peace camp inside Israel and a peace camp on the Palestinian side has an, a logical contradiction in it and is not going to work. Uh, the only way it's going to work is indeed to adopt the ANC model where white people join the liberation movement of Africans. And we should look for a model in the future that allows anti-Zionist Jews to join that liberation struggle in the 21st century very much as Ronnie joined the ANC. The third fact that I would like to mention in this respect is that whatever has become or has turned into the Israeli peace camp or what we call in Israel liberal Zionism or left Zionism uh, and even the non-Zionist communist party which is an important part of the peace camp in Israel are still wedded to the idea of the two-state solution as if it were a Catholic marriage. Uh, Palestinian members of Knesset, the, the Palestinian Authority endure the two-state solution despite the fact that they all know that it has been dead for years, is not viable. And in fact, keep talk, keeping talking about it provides an umbrella of immunity for the Israeli uh, impunity uh, on the ground. Now, what do we learn from these three undeniable facts? One is that we need a new 
clear, democratic, authentic, official Palestinian voice and vision that redefines what the liberation of Palestine means in the 21st century. A vision that adapts to the reality of the 21st uh, century and, um, uh, and by that maintaining its loyalty to a just peace. Uh, we have the beginning of such a vision uh, in the three rights that the BDS movement uh, promised to, um, to protect the right uh, of return for the refugees, the rights of Palestinians and Israel to live in equality, and the rights of the people in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip not to live under military occupation uh, or uh, siege. But we need, this is not a, a vision by itself. The vision needs to have an end game. And uh, this end game has to be uh, drawn by the Palestinians through uh, their national uh, bodies for the whole of Palestine and for the whole of the Palestinians. And then you might get a clear idea of the structure that should carry this vision to uh, the only possible solution in Palestine, which is one democratic state for all from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean. Now, until this happens, and I'm not very optimistic that this will happen very soon, but it will happen because if that's not happening, nothing else would, nothing else would happen. But until this happens, uh, I would not expect any change from within Israel as someone who's been active here among the Jewish community for so many years. I know that there's only a small group of anti-Zionist Jews. Uh, they are important. They are growing in numbers. Uh, but at this moment in time, they have no impact whatsoever on the policies of the apartheid state of Israel. Uh, but they should continue, and they should continue to educate the Jewish society about the history uh, of Palestine, because most Israeli Jews are ignorant of the history of, of Palestine. They should understand that Zionism is an ideology of a settler colonial movement, very much as apartheid South Africa was an ideology of a white settler colonial movement. They should understand that such an ideology uh, brought about the ethnic cleansing in 1948 of half of Palestine's population, and that that ideology is behind the criminal policies after 1948, whether it is the military rule that was imposed on the Palestinians in Israel, or the occupation itself of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and all the other very long list of war crimes that Israel perpetrated against the Palestinians wherever they are from 67 until today. Uh, our role as anti-Zionist Jews within this paradigm of anti-apartheid and decolonization of Palestine is really to convey the Israelis two very important messages. One is that they're going to lose a lot of the privileges that they have if they want to live in a, a just democratic country. Uh, there's no other way of doing it. Uh, they have privileges at the expense of the Palestinians, and these privileges will be taken for them for their own good and for uh, the uh, purpose of peace and reconciliation. Um, and, and I think anyone who doesn't tell the Israelis this in the face makes a mistake by not explaining that this is going to be a painful process. Uh, and the other uh, maybe for some Israelis also another painful message, and I think we're working on it here as activists, anti-Zionist activists in Israel, is to convey to the Israelis that their vision of being part of Europe is uh, factually wrong, geographically wrong, but also very dangerous. It alienates the region and it perpetuates Israel's position as an alien uh, uh, um, uh, country in 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 the uh, in the region. Uh, in many ways, uh, region is a little bit like uh, a big ship that is looking for a safe uh, haven or safe uh, harbor. Uh, Israelis tend to think that they are not on that ship, uh, and that ship can also sink, as we have seen several times. Uh, so, in in a way, even if they occupy the best uh, cabin on the on the Titanic. It doesn't mean that they're not on the Titanic. If, God forbid, 
this is where the Middle East is going now. Where I hope it will go eventually to a safe harbor. You need to be part of the problems of the Arab world and you have to be part of its solution. You cannot claim to be out of it. Um, the international community within this uh, reality that I'm uh, describing can help, of course, first and foremost, by continuing the great work that the BDS has been uh, uh, doing. Uh, but I think the BDS should now be much more and strongly connected to the ODS. We should, we should move from BDS to ODS. The ODS is the one democratic state. And of course, the Israeli apartheid week that students are uh, uh, have been uh, staging all over the world is a very strong, genuine show of solidarity uh, with the Palestinians uh, on the ground. Uh, but it needs now, I think, to be part of a much more clearer uh, uh, solution for the future. We need a counter deal to the steel of the century or the deal of the century. Um, and to realize that that deal of the century is not just, I'm talking about Trump's deal of the century, is not just a bad uh, uh, solution. It's far, far worse than that. It's an assault on Palestine and the Palestinian. It's an attempt to depoliticize the Palestinian issue an idea that was concocted in Washington and Tel Aviv and Jerusalem uh, to try and claim that there is no political issue in Palestine, only an economic one. Um, in order to, to fight against this deal and its possible uh, uh, destructive impact on, the, on Palestine and Palestinians, uh, uh, people outside of Palestine, I think, can continue and help also by changing the language that they use by the media, by the politicians, by the academics. They're not using the right language. We should talk about colonization, decolonization, apartheid, regime change, the end to ethnic cleansing and crime against humanity, and put aside the whole discourse about peace, uh, coexistence, and all the other uh, uh, entry in the, in the vocabulary that the two-state solution process to nowhere has uh, created uh, uh, for us. And uh, of course, uh, by doing that, uh, we, I think we'll also successfully fend off the accusation of anti-Semitism that Israel and its supporters has weaponized in order to silence anyone who criticizes Israel. I will finish uh, by saying that unfortunately, and that's my dismay, but it doesn't, uh, make me uh, stop uh, being active for one uh, second, uh, is that I think that the three tasks that I was talking about ca uh, cannot happen simultaneously. There's one depends on the other. And until we I'll come back to the first point I made, until we have a clear Palestinian vision for what are Palestinians all over Palestine, and those who were expelled from Palestine. What are they fighting for? Which I'm sure is not a two-state solution anymore. But we need to hear what is the alternative that they're fighting for. It would be much easier for me as an activist on the ground, both in Britain and in Israel, to organize support for that kind of a campaign. Uh, I'm not going to work even one second to, to convince people to support the two-state solution. Uh, I'm not uh, in the business of uh, 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 taking a dead body and making it alive again or extracting it from, from the morgue and donning it with all kinds of clothing in order to, to claim that it's still alive. Um, but it would be much easier to have a co Palestinian compass uh, that with international solidarity and proactive support on the ground by anti-Zionist Jews can still, I think, uh, bring an end to the apartheid regime in Israel and uh, create, uh, replace it with a democratic state for all, uh, which will be good both for the Jews and for the Palestinians after 120 years of unnecessary uh, bloodshed and oppression. Thank you very much. Okay. I need this now. Can you unmute me? Thank you very much, Elon. That was enlightening, Ronnie. Um, without any ado, please, the floor is all yours. Well, thanks very much, and thanks for having me. I'm breathless after Elan's input. Hi, my dear, dear comrade and friend and brother, Elan. 
I want to immediately say that the likes of Ilan and Yuri Davis, it's two of them, um, in terms of full scale support for the Palestinian struggle, and Ilan mentioned uh, Yuri and one other who were part of the liberation movement of Palestinians. The South African situation gives, uh, the, it, it's the same. Ilan and Yuri, if they'd been in South Africa, they would have been part of the ANC-led liberation struggle. One of them once said to me, Ronnie, if but for the fact that your ancestors, instead of coming to Israel, uh, in, sorry, instead of coming to South Africa, had been in Israel, we'd been in the same struggle. But it, it's a key element of a difference that the ANC had very early on been so inclusive, not just to the 80% of indigenous black Africans, because we got a mixed population. They're those of Asiatic Indian origin. They're those who came from Europe. And there are those of mixed race, which are in South Africa, it's, it's termed colored mixed race. Apartheid division, like imperialist division to divide and rule, plays on being keeping people in different camps. What the ANC, and I must say the Communist Party of South Africa, the one created in 1912, the, own, the oldest liberation move, national movement in Africa, the ANC, Communist Party from 1921, came to unite two cleavages, two divisions within the society, class and race, to bring them together. And the ANC in the mid 50s with its Freedom Charter, which was inclusive and said that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, was able to create the basis for a broad movement of all our people. And there were more whites, but a minority, a great minority of whites in South Africa, but more than in the Palestinian-Israeli situation. Ilan is just a brilliant example of that kind of emancipation. But in South Africa, it amounted to several hundred in a mass movement, of course, of tens and tens of thousands who were on board. And what does that say? What does it say to the internal struggle? What does that radiate to the international community that there's an absolute inclusivity towards, as the Freedom Charter said, South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. In the mid fifties, it was only the special branch of the government and, and, and the Favutites who paid attention and said that was communism. The white population were brainwashed, they were frightened, they didn't pay attention. But as the struggle unfolds, enormous qualitative changes take place because of the immense contradictions within the system, which are there as they were in South Africa, which are there within the Zionist Israel situation, as they are within America over four centuries culminating to the perfect storm developing there today against racial discrimination. And when we talk about the fight against racial discrimination from South Africa to the United States to Britain and Europe, and it, it, it's got to be to the fore, the connection in Palestine, in the Holy Land, as it was called. So I'm talking about Palestine as it was, um, and it's got to be to the fore that it's the race discrimination, the apartheid state, but what does that cover? It covers the exploitation of a people, the dispossession which happened to the South African people, which brings us so very close together. So in this time that I have left, I'll mention for our friends internationally, 
they've asked me, what's the, the experience of the BDS movement? We started off by calling it a boycott movement in South Africa. It started in very humble ways. It started with an internal boycott of the humble potato in the 1950s because the potato farmers, these white overlords that ran their massive land, their farms with slave labor provided from the prisons, from the police cells, from the magistrates sentencing Africans without the passport, the ID document to serve in those farms where they were driven like serfs and murdered in the potato fields. So the African National Congress came up with the potato boycott. They then looked to the idea of international support. And I'm talking about late 50s. The anti-apartheid movement was essentially born in London. Why London? We don't love the British, but they were the colonial occupier, the force that created the whole of South Africa over the centuries to the point of apartheid in 1948, the same year, the same month where Israel grabbed its, its unilateral, illegal, criminal um, property uh, and, and its ethnic cleansing. The same month, not just the same year. But there we are, we, we have that particular aspect, the beginning of that. So the ANC looks to the international community, it goes to London, and an anti-apartheid movement is started in 1959 to boycott, not the humble potato because that's not exported, but the beautiful orange that's replacing the beautiful Yaffa orange that had been produced by Palestinian brains and hands in those, those farms that made wealth for Palestinians over so many centuries. And it's the orange that is selected as the prime symbol of apartheid in terms of trade, in boycotting. And the lesson of that, because it worked beautifully, it transmuted into the Cape grape, the Cape wines, and then other products, to the extent that Foster, a fascistic, after Favut's assassination, prime minister said, every product that South Africa sells internationally is a brick in the wall of our existence. And the BDS movement were going to prove him wrong by removing those bricks. So from potato to orange and grape and wine to divestment to sanctions, it played out over 30 years. The BDS movement of Palestine has advanced very rapidly. But it was the Sharpeville massacre, which has been referred to today, brought me into the struggle as a 20-year-old kid um, in 1960 March that suppressed the internal movement for some time, banned the ANC, led it in a few years to in Mandela's incarceration um, and so many others. But it galvanized the international community. And from Britain to the Netherlands, your country, to Spain, where Alice is from, to um, the whole of Europe, and then America, where the black movement, the black lobby, incensed by racist South Africa, pushed through its demands. And we saw in the space of those 10, the first decade, the second decade, we saw at the, the end of the first decade, a focus on sports. And this is why it's so important. You understand the soft underbelly. Where can we hit them? Of course, we have a long menu of companies trading, of products and so on. Focus in on concrete identification and symbols, the orange, housewives throughout Europe and from Sweden, where it was tremendous, the boycott, but everywhere else would not buy South African fruit. And the posters were of the South African orange dripping with blood. But there's a guy called Peter Hayne who actually said in London to the anti-apartheid movement, 
it's it's very good uh, big marches protesting against South African sport because these racist sports teams are coming and going to Mother Britain all the time. We've got to disrupt it. The anti-apartheid movement balked. They said, well, well, you know, this is going to alienate British public. Hain was a liberal, a small little group of his friends began to disrupt those events. By 1970, the British public, at least the thinking public, the anti-apartheid movement, realized we will disrupt these sports games. And at the stadium where South Africa tried to play cricket against England, Lords and Leeds and the oval, the hollowed grounds, there were thousands outside and inside there were activists who got onto the pitch, it was disrupted and it was called off. Within weeks of that, the Olympic Committee banned South Africa from the Olympic Games. Within another year or two, the same happened in Australia. South Africa, Australia, rugby, cricket, it's a religion. Within 10 years, it took another 10 years, New Zealand, and I saw the documentaries of a New Zealand welcoming a Springbok rugby team in 1966. They welcomed them as the golden boys of the West. They loved them. The uh, challenge was so exciting. These are the two major rugby playing nations, quite frankly. And the people of New Zealand <laughs> turned out against the rugby lovers who were there and saying, don't you dare mix sport with politics, you communist rebel. But there were thousands and thousands. They disrupted the games. That was the last time South Africa ever, ever, ever dared to send a sporting tourist team abroad. You know what that did? It inspired over those years the struggling masses of South Africa, because in this time, there were the ebbs, the flows, like in Palestine, the dark periods, the bleak, the intifadas. It inspired the people in South Africa to greater efforts. Psychologically, what a body blow to the racists, to the apartheid regime, to their community, brainwashed like those in Israel, quite frankly, to see any opposition as threatening their lives, as wanting to push them into the sea. And that isolation of South Africa over the years paid dividends. And if you come to boycott, linking in with divestment, we got thousands and thousands in all those countries to rally to the anti-apartheid cause. And the divestment and the sanctions campaign absolutely blossomed. I have a friend, Tony Bloom, who was a big businessman in South Africa. And he said to me, Ronnie, my daughter, my son was in Britain at Oxford and I was sending them money to Barclays Bank. But they responded to me to say, Barclays Bank's being boycotted here. Father, find another way of getting us money. In time, the banking system bowed down because that was then another big, big target with divestment, that the trade unions, the universities, the churches would divest from their pension fund investments and so on into any investment program linked to South Africa. It hit South Africa in the belly, in the gut. And together with the Americans under the black lobby pressure by 1986, a huge turning point, Kodak, General Motors, IBM, and then Chase Manhattan, and then Barclays cut business ties with South Africa. When we came to negotiations, a national apartheid era minister said to me, Ronnie, when I saw Barclays cutting ties with South Africa, the Barclays that my grandfather, my father and myself grew up seeing as iconic to our economic well-being, pulling out of South Africa in 1986, he said to me, I saw that we were doomed. Sanctions, let me quickly say in the little time I think I've got left, that the sanctions 
through the United Nations, through its resolutions, economic, military, embargo of South Africa, the sanctions aspect had led by the 80s with a mass upsurge in South Africa after the Soweto uprising and the mass uprisings inside South Africa. It had led to that particular point where even Britain and France who had provided South Africa with what were now obsolete Mirage jets and, and, and naval craft and tanks, et cetera, they were obsolete. Zionist Israel was the ally of apartheid South Africa and was bringing South Africa its armaments, even to the extent of nuclear weapons, as we well know, arming this hated, racist, once Nazi-loving, apartheid discriminatory colonial state. And what happened was that they had to cease providing those weapons, except Israel, I've said. And you know something? I became a Deputy Minister of Defense in 1994. I discovered from the Air Force people who had served in the SADF, South African Defense Force, that actually the, um, the, the development of the Mirage with Israel was a useless fighter craft that when it came, to the war in Angola, where South Africa was the aggressor, Cuba came in, in terms of support for Angola, and they had the Russian MiGs, that they couldn't match them with what was called the cheetah, the South African equivalent of what Israel had at that time. We know Israel now has the most up-to-date in the weaponry in the world, courtesy of the United States, disgusting and shameful. But that helped to turn the tide in Angola it was the fighting quality, of course, of the Cubans and the, the Angolans that defeated the South Africans who were fighting so far from home. And the Angolans with the Cuban internationalists had a just cause, but they had better military equipment and they had control of the skies. That was the effect of the sanctions applied against South Africa. It affected the morale of the South African Defence Force. There were young white troops, conscripts, who could not see themselves giving their blood to defend a system that increasingly was being seen as revolting to the world and increasingly white South Africans began to feel that in fact it wasn't representing their interests. So it was a small number like the Fusniks in Israel, but um, it was a harbinger, like the Ilan Pappies and the Rodney Cattle, the Joe Slovers we had in South Africa, that actually the regime was not really able to work. But you take all that into account and culminating in the disinvestment where those banks I mentioned, including Barclays, had basically said, coming to 1989, 90, before 90, that we are not going to roll over the apartheid debt. We no longer are going to talk about investment. You've got to pay your debt now. This was the absolute end of apartheid. And of course, then the apartheid elite leaders and its supporters in Britain and Europe and America were saying, park the coming of an insurrection of the red revolution of communism. You guys, if you want to save your property and you want to save your wealth and economy, give political power over to the blacks, which is actually what happened. It wasn't a sellout on Mandela's part because there is this point about the struggle for power that first obtained political power. And that obviously was impelling the ANC with its support base, its allies, including more and more of, of unification of the, of the country behind them and the peeling away of whites, not all joining the ANC, but peeling away from believing that apartheid could continue to, con to, to secure their future. And for big business, the Oppenheimers, the oligarchs of South Africa, um, the, these guys in league with big capital and the corporates internationally started pulling the plug. That's going to happen in Israel. Like Ilan said, 
sooner, later, we in for a protracted struggle. The Palestinians have, what South Africa showed at that time, resolution, resolve, determination. Some would, what a beautiful word, which is why the Palestinians, whatever happens, can never be defeated. And let us, as I end, remark about what's happening in America. What happened in South Africa at our tipping point in 1989, 90 Battle of Quito Carnival, where the perfect storm is taking place, where a perfect storm is taking place in America, where that perfect storm, because of the contradictions of the system, will take place within Palestine, Israel. And that is where everything breaks up, the cracks appear, and the beautiful liquid of freedom start seeping through those cracks and the people are inspired. My last point to emphasize that the lessons of the South African struggle is the interconnection between internal political mobilization, mass struggle was reinforced in our situation by an underground network so vital to any resistance and to armed blows but those aspects are dependent on your own conditions or the conditions in palestine but in terms of that the symbiotic relationship between internal struggle and the external international solidarity the bds movement which is growing from strength to strength in relation to palestine to isolating israel is winning, will win, and the two affect each other. When the Palestinian internal situation like the South Africans rises to heights, it inspires the external international solidarity BDS. At times when the internal struggle is in ebb as it happens, it's ups and downs, the external provides the encouragement and the inspiration. So it's symbiotic, it's connected, it's part of the one struggle. And this is why we were able in South Africa to develop a strategy, inclusivity, that was also able to draw on whites within our country to break the myth that racism, that Zionism will ensure the purity of one camp of domination, Zionism, over all Palestinians, a Jewish state in South Africa, that it would ensure the domination of white supremacy over all the colored peoples, black and brown of South Africa. It fails. We've got a just cause. This is the main comparison. We've got moral ascendancy over the immorality of Zionist Israel over apartheid Israel as we had over apartheid South Africa. I hope I've kept to my time. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you both so much. Ilan uh, Pape and Ronnie Kasriel from a radical new Palestinian-led vision and mobilization of a struggle who all uh, those of justice can then uh, join uh, to the perfect storm and, a, and very much so a symbiotic, inclusive and a connected uh, struggle against uh, all forms uh, of racism. Um, thank you so much. It was definitely much food for thought for all those listening in. Please feel free to send your questions uh, via chat uh, and also make sure to uh, include uh, who you uh, your question is directed to. But first, let me give the floor to Alice Samson Estape, who is a very much so a prominent and well-known activist and head of the BDS uh, Europe, who will be our discussant of the uh, two main speakers today. Uh, Alice, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for all the groups in, in Netherlands for organizing this. It's it's a real honor for me to, to, to be able to, to be the first person to speak after Ilan. Ilan, I'm sorry we can't see you, but um, I first heard you speak once in, in Beit Sahur. I've read many of your books, so it's, it's really an honor to, to share this space with you. and. And Ronnie, I was lucky enough to meet you just over a year ago in the UK. I've been uh, brought up in a home where you were very much um, considered an idol, and we had a photo of you next to Mandela. So it's, it's again, I say it, it's, it's a real honor to speak uh, 
next to um, to a fighter like you. I think uh, both of your uh, speeches have been very helpful uh, on how how struggles are, are, are progressive and how all the challenges we face. I think it's quite common for activists in solidarity with Palestine in the BDS movement to feel frustrated very often, uh, which is which is normal when we're facing something that is so huge, such a powerful state like Israel is that uses so many different strategies to criminalize our solidarity and of course to make it much harder uh, for Palestinians to, to achieve freedom and for others to to struggle uh, next to that. Uh, some days are more inspiring than others, like today, as, as Ronnie was mentioning, we had a, a huge uh, victory coming from the European Court for Human Rights, uh, stating that, um, that calling for boycott for Israel is a civil right. And uh, at the BNC, the Boycott National Committee, believes that this momentous court ruling is a decisive victory for freedom of expression, for human rights defenders, and for the BDS movement, uh, for freedom, justice, and equality for Palestinians. And it's clear that it's a major legal blow to Israel's apartheid regime and its anti-BDS warfare. And it's coming just at a time, as Rani was saying now, when European citizens who were all incredibly inspired by the Black Lives Matter uprising in the US and trying to challenge the ugly legacy of European colonialism in France, Germany, and all other EU uh, countries to end this racist repression of human rights defenders campaigning uh, to end with Israeli apartheid. And I think it was very helpful to just, just listen to you uh, and explaining how um, there, there's challenges and there's easier times and there's harder times. So let's, let's enjoy these opportunities where we see that uh, how quickly the BDS movement is evolving and how legally and politically we are getting closer, but there's uh, a very long uh, road to go. Um, as we were discussing before also, Ronnie, I think something that, that happens a lot inside of the BDS movement is that we compare constantly to South Africa, which, which I think can be very helpful and we have certainly learned so much. But of course, the world has changed so much. And we're, we live in a world right now that is so far to the right. So many governments are, are governed by uh, far right political parties. Uh, criminalization, repression has changed so much that I do think that, um, uh, that, that, that we can't compare as if there is an exact same pattern how apartheid was ended in South Africa and how it will end in Israel. And I think. Many times we seek for this tipping uh, point you were just talking about right now, and it can feel very frustrating when you see just how brutal Israeli apartheid is and how it keeps on getting more brutal. Right now we're on the eve of annexation that the Israeli government has just announced when there have been only in the recent years all those all the killings uh, during the Great March of Return, I think there's times when we think, when exactly is the tipping point going to come? When uh, are states finally going to live up and stop um, supporting Israeli apartheid? Um, so this is one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Ron, is how can activists, how can we keep on pushing the narrative that Israel is in fact um, an apartheid state and that states must end their complicity with, uh, with Israel just in the same way they did with apartheid South Africa. And I want to reiterate that Palestinian civil society has again called for effective measures by all states to stop Israel's illegal annexation uh, and calling with specific examples to ban arms trade and military security cooperation with Israel, to suspend free trade agreements with Israel, to prohibit all trade with the illegal Israeli settlements and ensure that companies refrain and terminate business with Israel's illegal settlement enterprise, and to ensure that individuals and corporate actors responsible for war crimes and crimes against humanity in the context of Israel's regime of illegal occupation and apartheid are actually brought to justice. So if we could hear a bit more from you of how, how we can mainstream this narrative that Israel is an apartheid state and how can we push for sanctions? And then uh, to Elan, my question to you is, it was uh, it was great to hear you talk 
of the reality in in Israel, which of course you know uh, you know so well. And um, again, uh, recalling that the BDS movement, as as you said, doesn't call uh, for states. What Palestinians are always saying is it doesn't make sense to talk about different states and how. Um, the region is organized geographically. What we need to talk about is about rights. And until Palestinian rights aren't respected, then it doesn't make sense to talk about that. But I wanted to ask you, because there was an art article that came out in the magazine 972 that said that the Jewish left is starting to recognize the term apartheid and abandoning uh, only talking about an occupation, but talking more and more about apartheid. And I wanted to hear from you if you think that uh, if the BDS movement and um, Israel's brutal regime of, of oppression and dispossession is contributing to actually push further and further to the left uh, activists in Israel. Um, thank you. So, Alice, do you want me to come in first? Sure, I don't think uh, the uh, it matters which one speaks first. Uh, Ronnie first and then Elan after. Okay, Elan, I'm ahead of you now. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> no problem. Age, age before beauty, Elan. <laughs> age before age. So, uh, Alice, I think you put this so well. And let me first make a point about the context in which the struggle from the 60s to the 90s was taking place very different to today in that period we didn't have the global neoliberal free market remember it was late 80s that reaganomics with thatcher starts bringing that about that makes a huge difference we didn't have at that stage the really and it's a paper tiger, I'm using a Maoist term, <laughs> America, it's not quite, but you get what I mean, the contradictions that beset, that's what the Chinese were talking about. America wasn't so dominant in a bipolar world, it was that difference. It was also a period of huge advances in the national liberation movements, throughout the world, Algeria in the 50s, Vietnam from the 50s and on, Africa in the 60s, armed struggles, liberation struggles, Cuba, Latin America. And uh, these had a popular resonance amongst the youth of the world and trade unions, the left, etc. So it was quite a different situation and I really feel the Palestinians have had the bad luck of the draw to have been the remaining country, people struggling against colonialism, dispossession of land and rights, the lost. But at this phase where the unipolar American dominated free market neoliberal world economy relations of power etc have been so dominant that's what's made their struggle that much more difficult however and this is the wonderful aspect of coronavirus <laughs> the silver lining who would have thought you know and I'm making this as a joke though and it's horrible but who could ever predict what's going to happen in our world in terms of its contradictions, in terms of what's happening to the climate, the ecology? So we've had the perfect storm in America, an absolute useless, racist, pathetic buffoon of a president. We've had the online image of George Floyd's nine minutes of execution. And we've had, because of the virus, black and whites in America sitting at home without need to go to work, absolutely inspired and revolted at what was happening at the time to get through onto the street and create this incredible crisis in America. And who knows how that's going to change the world? 
who knows how this is going to impact on Netanyahu, the Zionists, the annexation plans. What we have to always do through thick and thin, and even when we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, is know that the contradictions inherent in racist capitalism, the neoliberalism, the empire, Pax America, whatever, in Europe, the oligarchs, etc. that this is going to come unstuck. And what can help to bring it unstuck sooner than later is the resistance, the resolve, the summit of the people, which the Palestinians are showing, and which is why I, I am frankly, and I take into account Gramsci's saying of the pessimism of the intellect, but the optimism of the will. We have to be optimistic, and that's not being romantic. And Fidel Castro said that it's vital for revolutionaries, for activists, for people wanting change, to keep that hope alive. What the Palestinians do in their resistance inspires us all. It makes us believe that there can be a change world. And America and Black Lives Matter, African America, is showing that as well. So I wouldn't predict, but it's not the question that it's just going to go on and on and on. BDS, as it did with South Africa, where I, I can tell you, it pales into significance. Those 30 years from apartheid to the end, we had centuries of colonial oppression, of course, seemed like an absolute 10 lifetimes compared to what the Intifada is, which uh, and, and, and the Nahba, sorry, is, which keeps going. But there is the light at the end of the tunnel. So what can we do inside our country and externally is to create the structures, raise the awareness, so that when the bubble bursts, as it did with, with George Floyd, that you've got the masses on your side. You've got structures in place to take advantage. I don't have any criticism for the BDS movement. For Omar Boguti and the comrades from Palestine, they're doing the right thing. We've got the right message. We'll make some mistakes, some errors here and there. We must help each other. I would say from the South African example of picking on the Afghan orange, of picking on sport, of picking on culture. There should be a picking on the Eurovision contest, where Israel's part of it, on the UFA soccer league, which Israel is part of. This is where we should focus such power pressure as to crack one nut after another, at the same time carrying on with that menu of ours of the divestment of the sanctions of the United Nations, etc., of the work that Ilan, Yuri, the academics are doing, the Diane Butos, and the coming together, the encouragement, they must do something which I didn't believe when I was younger you could ever see in Israel-Palestine until I met the Yuri Davises and the Ilan Papas and the uh, Avi Shlans and, and others, that there were Jews who could say, we are Palestinians, and the Palestinians to recognize this. And it's not as though I'm putting those Jews or those whites in South Africa on a pedestal. What it does do is that it actually helps to keep the moral high ground to show you are inclusive, that you're not going to, to, to push people into the steam. You're going to change a Zionist structure and rule, and you're going to come up with a inclusive one, which in, in my case, I do go along with the One Democratic State, by the way, I'm a fan of that and a supporter, and that's the South African example. Although I will stand back and say, because we've been having these arguments in South Africa, by the way, that with the annexation, with the call by BDS and the Global South, which is what we've been asked to get together, the, the voice and the endorsement, isn't at this point, Ilan, to say that you, We've got to resolve one state, two state. I absolutely accept that to get clarity, you have to know what your objective is. But I must say that we take our guidance from the BDS 
National Committee out of Ramallah in this respect. And we must maintain our unity in action at all costs. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that thorough answer, uh, Ronnie. Elon, please come in. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Ronnie, for, for very clear uh, and excellent uh, answers. Um, I'm not sure uh, exactly uh, what motivates uh, today uh, young Israeli uh, Jews uh, to become a bit more clear in their attitude towards uh, Zionism and accepting that the, the problem in Palestine is not just the occupation of 1967, but goes back to the late 19th century and is connected to the ideology of the state and uh, the history of the of the Zionist movement since the late 19th century. Um, uh, definitely, those of of our friends that warned us that the BDS movement would uh, kill the opposition from within were totally wrong. In fact, the, the BDS movement, I think, contributed to a certain clarity among uh, activists on the Israeli left. Uh, and I think clarify to them what the meaning of solidarity is. And as I said in my talk to, tonight, it wasn't easy because even Palestinian leaders told them that their role is to uh, create a, a peace camp. But they were not supposed to create a peace camp. They were supposed to show solidarity very much <clears throat> as people in, in, in Holland show solidarity with the Palestinian people. And it was very, it's very difficult to make this transformation. I think the reality on the ground contributes a lot to this understanding. The fact that young Israelis have been traveling a lot and see things from the outside. Uh, so it's a combination of the Palestinian resistance, uh, steadfastness, um, the BDS movement, and the reality on the ground that, thank God, keeps at least, at least a small group of uh, Israelis in this kind of of situation as all is always in the left and that's nothing new it's not typical it's not um, only the case uh, it's not exceptional for israel uh the most uh, kind of uh, the, the main barrier from uh between this group and making an impact uh, in the israeli society is not the right wing in israel it is the zionist left uh and um and therefore I think one of the most important tasks in front of us is to let people who walked quite a long uh, distance to take the extra mile that is needed to complete their journey. Uh, it was, uh, I think you, uh, 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 the commentators uh, 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 mentioned um, uh, the website plus 972. Uh, it's a very, uh, this very website is a very interesting a litmus paper for that, what I'm talking about. Uh, very few people there dare to declare themselves as anti-Zionist, but they are now beginning to declare themselves as non-Zionist. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm patient. I, I think it's, it's a process where, um, I know it from myself, uh, very difficult to kind of uh, lay behind you or sort of leave behind you basic truisms basic principles that you were taught are moral, are exclusive, and you should defend them, uh, even die for them. Uh, so it's not easy for them to, to make this transformation. Uh, but I think um, uh, there's too much evidence on the ground, and there's too much uh, uh, clarity in the position of the outside world, if not from the government, at least from the civil society, for anyone with a modicum of decency in them, not to see that uh, they need to take the brave step and uh, face their own society, even at the, uh, the risk of being called uh, traitors, uh, because uh, they will play a very positive role for their own society in the future. Uh, the more they are of th this kind of, of people, the, ch the better chance we have to have a peaceful restitution in Palestine, because one day uh, this Zionist regime will fall. All, all uh, evil regimes in history come to an end. And it's very important to make sure that the transition to a just and democratic society 
is the one that was envisaged by people like Nelson Mandela uh, and not uh, to have the unpleasant experience of decolonization that some uh, African and Arab countries had. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Ilan. It's now time to actively include all of you. And with all of you, I mean the 112 participants that we do not see on the screen. Um, you're very welcome uh, to send in your questions um, via the chat, and many of you have already done so. Uh, we will include you uh, in the conversation through a Q&A question and answer, which my co-moderator, uh, Sonia Zimmerman, uh, we'll convey your questions through the speakers. Um, so please, uh, Sonia, can you turn on your camera and join us? Yes, Thank you. The floor is all yours. I cannot hear you right now. No, not yet, maybe now. Mute. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, can. Sonia, for uh, joining us also by camera now. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, there's a, a whole load of questions and um, I've been hard put um, arranging them. Um, because I was also very distracted by everything that was being said. Um, but that's my fate, I suppose. So let me start with Ronnie. Professor Pape, greetings from Leonard Shapiro in Cape Town, South Africa. Which movements or groups do you recommend that anti-Zionist Jews around the world join in order to contribute to the return of one democratic state in Palestine? Is, is that Sorry. to me? That's, That's to you, to uh, Ilan. Ilan. Oh, uh, Ilan. Yes. Yeah, Ronnie, I got it. I also got confused. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hi, hi, uh, Piro. Nice to. I can't see you, but. Uh, <laughs> you can't see so, me? Yeah. Uh, no, no, I can see you, but I cannot see the, okay. the person who asked the question. I saw him in South oh, Africa in 2014, I think, yes, and I also saw Ronnie there. Anyway, um, the, uh, the question is what anti-Zionist organizations? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, there is, uh, that's part of the issue, that uh, we don't have a proper anti-Zionist organization either worldwide uh, and we don't want, we don't have one uh, which is institutionalized as an organization or as a popular movement on the ground in Israel. Uh, there are interesting, uh, there's an interesting initiative. Uh, I'm part of it. I hope it will take off to have in Basel, in Switzerland, the first anti Zionist Jewish conference. Uh, with the same number of delegates as the Zionists had uh, when they first met there in 1897, sort of undoing by declaration uh, the project, if not by deeds, at least uh, by words. Um, uh, I don't know if it will take off because there's so many uh, different Jewish voices on this. As you know, Jews always need three synagogues, even if there are only two of them one to go to and one not to go to. Uh, so uh, it's not easy to work it out. Um, I think that the most, for me, the most impressive initiative, and I'm part of it, and I think it's going to take off very seriously, is the One Democratic uh, uh, um, State Campaign, the ODSC, o uh, which uh, has a website you can look at, uh, and Facebook. It differs from other uh, uh, outfits that deal with the one state solution that it is located in Israel and Palestine. It is not located outside. And it has branches in the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, the Galilee, and the South. On purpose, this group of people don't call themselves a movement because they want to be very democratic. And they see their role as enhancing a dialogue for an alternative vision of a one state replacing the vision of two states. 
and they want the dialogue to include as many uh, uh, groups and individuals as possible, including the, Isla the Islamic movement, uh, the Communist Party, and so on. So if you look at the ODSC, which I think is now also looking for support from the outside, I feel that this is the grain from which uh, a movement can grow later, uh, uh, which will kind of organize anti-Zionist Jews inside and outside in total and genuine solidarity with the Palestinians who should really lead the way uh, to the full liberation for the sake of all of us. Thank you. Interesting. There is another related uh, question. Um, it's also about uh, Jews in America. Uh, in this case, it's about Jews in America. It says, it's addressed to both speakers, and it says, can anyone comment on the tendency for Jewish groups in the USA, even anti-Zionist, anti-Jewish state groups, to at least implicitly, but often explicitly, place emphasis on the voice of American Jews when it comes to the issue of Israeli apartheid, etc. Jewish voice for peace comes to mind. It's a small group that has a very good mission statement and principles, but is functionally a little exclusive when it comes to leadership and recruitment, suggesting that Israel is, if not a Jewish problem, an issue about which Jews have more insight. Perhaps the experience of joining the ANC as a white South Africa, um, as a white South Africa, might lend some recalibration to this situation. My view is that ridding the Jewish uh, centrality of the issue of Israel, particularly in the USA, will help to get the peace wheels moving more quickly or at least more effectively. Could you comment on that? Thank you. I think Ronnie should start. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't claim to be a expert in any way of, of Jewish communities, by the way. You know, I grew up as a little bit of a Zionist Jew. As a small boy, I was 10 in 1948. And I thought that's where I belonged, the Jewish community. I don't deny my Jewish roots. But by becoming involved in a broader struggle of liberation for all South Africans, I actually lost that identity. And my identity became fully South African and African. And in looking at the Palestinian situation and Jews as part of a colonial settlement there, I could immediately begin to see that the only way, and I say this to the Jews of America and to Leonard Shapiro in Cape Town, I know him well who asked that first question, that the only way really is is, is the way of um, for Jews, the way of Ilan and Yuri and others. What what yes, we we have a Jewish heritage and relate. We had that in South Africa amongst progressive whites. And the ANC asked us to get together as whites in a particular compartment to organize support. I didn't feel so comfortable, but I took my orders. I was overjoyed when in time the ANC opened its doors to membership, not just of the black South Africans, but to whites like myself and to those of, of colored background like my comrades Naim Gina and Salim Valley and, and others. And, and I see some of, of very wonderful young Jewish people who in South Africa are part, part of a Jewish voice for peace. They're about, and have been, I think, and they'll forgive me if I mis, misunderstand, but three, four or so different attempts. The only way that Jews, wherever they are, within the Palestine, and the Yuri Davis saying that I'm a Palestinian Jew, I like that, or Jews of America or elsewhere, to regard the question of how you deal with anti-Semitism, of being Jewish and despised, of, of, of getting through that, 
is not the Zionist way, which was have a Jewish organization. The socialists, the Bolsheviks, the communists of Eastern Europe, they argued as, as, as they did amongst Jews in South Africa who migrated, that that's no way that you've got to do away with anti-Semitism, with race discrimination of all kinds, not by getting into your little camp like Zionists do, but by being part of a democratic movement that can create a real change in society in which everybody belongs. So uh, uh, that for me is, is the starting point. And I understand that Jewish people with a cultural background, not all are religious, um, do come together in, in terms of certain common interests and connections. But on their agenda, as number one should be the challenge that Elan is putting out. That's the challenge. They've got to get through that. That's my basic answer to that kind of question. And it, 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 it is the answer to the fate of Jews living in historic Palestine if they want, like whites living in South Africa before, whilst apartheid and colonial settlement was in place, racism was to come to terms with being Africans. That's the answer for me. Right. Ilan, you've abdicated from this question, haven't you? Uh, well, I, I, something short. Um, I think Ronnie said it almost all. I just want to say there's a difference between tactics in the US. Of course, you can target certain groups. You can go and talk to churches. You can go and talk uh, to the Jewish community, to the Hispanic community, to the African American community. And sometimes in, in a society like the United States, it's good to be aware of the social fabric. But I think that, and, and, and I, I have a lot of respect for what the Jews for Justice have been doing in the United States, and very bravely so. But I think in the end of the day, uh, we should uh, strive for two networks of solidarity, which I think is far more important than politics of identity. One network of solidarity is between oppressed people in the United States, and the Jews are not an oppressed group in the United States. Uh, Zionism tries sometimes to portray them as such, but they're not. They're, they're, uh, they're definitely, uh, their situation is not equivalent to that of African American or Native Americans. And, and I think that the, the solidarity of the oppressed, colonized people in America with the Palestinians is now far more important uh, uh, in building this international uh, solidarity. Then there is the, the, the overall solidarity movement in the United States, which I don't think should be really defined by someone's uh, religious identity or cultural identity, but should evolve around the theme of decolonization, anti-apartheid. I don't think that, that the anti, Ronnie will correct me, but I don't think the anti-apartheid or the solidarity movement with, with the ANC in the world was divided according to religion or culture. I think it was all around the, the, the solidarity with the people who wants to bring down, who wanted yeah. to bring down apartheid. And I think yeah. that's what we need now. Uh, but that doesn't mean, as I say, tactically, I can understand it. But, but more important than anything else, it's to have a clear language, a clear vision, and a clear understanding of solidarity. You don't tell the Palestinians what they should do. You ask them what they want you to do for them. And we all realize we don't have a clear Palestinian address. We don't have a clear Palestinian voice. And, but there's still, as the BDS movement has shown, there's so much you can do in the meantime, because I'm, I'm very optimistic. You know, Palestinian society is one of the youngest in the world. And what I hear from young people among the Palestinians gives me a lot of hope for a different kind of a Palestinian leadership and orientation in the very near future, which will, I think, help to solve some of the issues we've already uh, discussed uh, today. Thank you. All right. Here's a question on a very contemporary issue. Uh, it's for both speakers. How should we react to the annexation that Netanyahu is about to carry out? Uh, 
if I may, I'll start and then Ronnie can, can join. Um, uh, we, of course, we should, uh, in many ways, object to the annexation, but within the right uh, context. Uh, first of all, uh, the annexation is a declaration, not an act, in the sense that Israel has already annexed these territories that it's going to announce that it's going to annex. They're already annexed. Uh, and the, most of the people living in them were already ethnically cleansed by Israel. But the world likes the Israeli game by which if it doesn't declare that it does something, it didn't happen. So maybe yes or maybe not, on the 1st of July, Benjamin Netanyahu would declare something that Israel had already done. So if we didn't, if the world didn't do anything about it until the 1st of July, it wouldn't do much about it after the, the, the 1st of July. I think, of course, we should oppose the declaration as much as we should oppose the actions uh, on the ground, but we should never play the game that one part of Palestine or one Palestinian tragedy is worse than other Palestinian tragedies. Uh, Gaza is in a far more difficult position than anyone in the West Bank. And we, we haven't, we're not talking about Gaza in the last month or two. That's why we need to talk about the colonization of Palestine, the uh, incremental ethnic cleansing and, and pay much more attention to what the Israelis are doing than to what the Israelis are saying or declaring. Uh, and, and ask, because the Europeans uh, and, the, and the international community should have been doing a lot already uh, back in the 60s and the 70s and definitely in the last 20 years. So I think that we should continue what we are doing uh, and highlight the annexation as just another uh, example of what a settler colonial state is doing to the indigenous people if it is uh, uh, accepted in the world as a member in the community of civilized states. Thank you. Ronnie, do you, would you like to comment? Just, just briefly, because I, I really agree with, uh, with Ilan, and he knows the situation so much better than me. But from someone who's part of BDS and uh, what we've been asked to do in South Africa, um, you see, when they they go for broke, when they do what Netanyahu is doing in his crossway, um, it's so important that it's opposed and protested against, and to see that it gives us opportunity, because um, the opportunity that's provided, and it is, uh, people aren't looking at Gaza, but people are so affronted within governments, and I've seen this here in South Africa now, um, and in the global south, that you can put demands, you can, you can put endorsement of Palestinian civil society who's calling on the world, and in our hemisphere, the global south, to get governments to take action in relation to um, the whole question of applying military and economic sanction. And it starts occupying their mind and it opens up a debate. And in South Africa, we're going around now getting signatories and endorsements from hopefully government. It's, it's certainly the ruling ANC. Uh, and this will happen throughout the global south. And if we get those endorsements, which is looking likely, you can hold these continents, these hemispheres, to that commitment. Now, we know what rhetoric is and signing positions and endorsements, but it does give one the chance to raise awareness, to mobilize uh, in protest, and not to allow the Trumps and the Kushners, I mean, good grief, who the hell is this guy? Just, you know, it's bloody little son-in-law, excuse my language. Um, and uh, Netanyahu, this absolute corrupt thief, to think that they can do what they wish. And we've got to treat them in the way that the international movement kept treating the Fervuts and the Fosters and the PW Buertas who ruled South Africa, who, when we could crowd in on them with our BDS, that mobilization, and, and with our, the people inside the country, it, it really did create 
a sort of very necessary pressure that's, that's absolutely required. Do we still have time for another question, Anna? No, I feel bad because actually, no, we don't. Um, we set, we would uh, keep it at, at 8.30 and I think it's a good idea, especially uh, because it uh, has been such a well-rounded hall uh, as of now. And I do think uh, the conclusion should be that we need to organize even more seminars uh, like these, uh, like the one we spoke to tonight. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, you Thank have you. You have attended the third uh, webinar of the series in which Israel, Palestine and the question of apartheid has been uh, discussed. Let me thank Farah uh, Saidan, Sonia Zimmerman, Gerard Jonkman, Sue Blackwell, Christina Dijkstra, Egbert Harms and many more of Dogby, Palestine Link and the Rights Forum. Please uh, feel free to listen to the previous two sessions on the podcast of those websites. Um, and also spread the word of today's session, which will shortly appear on those websites as well. Also, special thanks uh, to Sonia Zimmerman as a co-moderator, uh, Alice Samson Estape as the discussant. Thank you so much, and also for your BDS work. And of course, um, uh, the two main speakers, Ilan Papi and Ronnie Cotsrill. Your uh, contribution has been in, in, in uh, Last but not least, I want to thank all the participants who have been listening. Uh, behind the scenes thank you for the attention tonight but also for thank you for educating yourself and for not closing your eyes for the injustices in palestine uh, today thank you all so much thank you thank you very much thank you see you soon mm -hmm. ronnie bye thank you Eli, for sure all of you thank you, see you soon. all the best <laughs> thank you bye 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 bye, bye, -bye.